will fade. Greetings, Bobo. Hello, Cliff. What's happening, man? Not much. Despite my general um, exhaustion and uh, soreness and stuff, I've been doing a lot of work on the property, taking down trees, running chainsaws, uh, sloping ground, blah, 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 blah. I still went walking in the woods yesterday. Neighbor Gary and I went walking in the woods. Around your house? No, no, no. Um, um, at a, one of the spots down the, um, down, uh, down the Clackamas River a bit. So Okay. Yeah, um, at one of our general locations. And um, it's nice to have neighbor Gary along because he asked, hey, Cliff, do you mind if I take a rifle along in case we see a mountain lion? And they're thinking, oh, that's he, of course, he's he's all tagged up. He, he's a total legal hunter and everything like that. And it is, it is mountain lion season all year long. And I said, absolutely. You are more than welcome to bring a gun for the one thing in the woods that I'm afraid of. You may hunt the thing that hunts me. Yes. Um, but we didn't see one. But we did find um, a footprint. And we may have found even a handprint um, underneath this uh, low-lying log. Um, and the handprint corresponds nicely to uh, the size that we would expect for a 12-inch footprint. How big is that? About the size of my hand, but thicker. Now, of course, both of these were in supersaturated soil. They were not fresh. Maybe they are um, from a person, although I think the per- the people hypothesis is kind of – tough on this one um the footprint was pretty eroded out again super saturated soil but there was at least one distinct toe with an extrusion um uh, uh, protrusion i guess some extrusion between that toe and the other ones um so kind of eliminates the boot thing um and what and i cast it kind of briefly hosed it off pretty quick and um there are suggestions of other toes, like little, you know, maybe it's not, maybe it's not, it's not clear enough to say much about. It. And the handprint um, is, is uh, kind of wonky looking as Sasquatch hands kind of are. Um, it, but it's not that bad. It's not bad. You know, I, I'd say both of these are definite maybes um, in that sort of tradition. We're not getting super, super clear stuff in, in this area, but we are getting kind of a lot of stuff that indicates they probably are around so pretty cool so it was nice to get out in the woods for the first time in a couple weeks um and nice to know that our spots are still producing um only walked two roads so i was thinking what todd dug up to the go road uh yesterday or t- two days ago and those guys i guess found uh prints and possibly a pile a scat pile so the day you didn't go they found some stuff isn't that how it goes you know kind of stinks but well whatever Whatever. Are, but are you going to go out and take a look at them? Yeah. Pro- yeah. Uh, it's not supposed to rain. I'm going to try to get out there possibly tomorrow. Yeah. Well, I hope you do. hope you do. Now, it's kind of early for that. Uh, how far up the go road? I think they're, you know, like that. Uh, I'm not sure, but I think they're going up just, you know, like that uh, 10, 12 mile area. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, that high, the, the ridges will probably be snowed in, I'm assuming. Yeah. It's, dude. Yeah. It's supposed to snow a little bit tonight, like just like an inch or two. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The weather kind of came in. Was it nice there last week, too? Oh, dude. We had some beautiful days. So some melt off then, at least. It's cold. It's real cold again. It's going to be in the 30s tonight here, which is on the beach. That's really cold for April. Well, I'm looking forward to getting out to Bluff this year. I'd like to get out there at some point, probably no earlier than July. Um, just to see what's burnt and what's not. I want to see uh, how far that fire went and what is still good. And even though it's 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 you know devastating and horrible to look at and stuff like that, I did learn a lot about the Clackamas River Basin by by seeing what it looked like after it burned because you can finally see the lay of the land. You know, I dude, that's so true. Like there's so many places I've been like, I'm like that's what this canyon looks like because it's just it's just some burnt stumps around. You know, you can see all the layout topography and it's it's yeah, it's like. It's like old. It's like a pre lidar. Yeah, right. It, it, it's a analog lidar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fidar fire. <laughs> <laughs> I found the same thing in Malala because um, we've been up to Malala together. Um, that place is all burnt out too. It's like, oh wow, that's what the. It's just crazy. It's just crazy. Well, you know, um, something else happened that this week that I'm pretty excited about. Um, so you know, we're doing the Ape Canyon thing, um, of course. Um, last week on the member section, I even announced tickets available for our Bigfoot and Beyond members, um, members only sort of, th- sort of thing. So if you are a member of uh, Bigfoot and Beyond, you're part of the Beyond Bigfoot and Beyond crowd, you can actually buy tickets to come hear a Mark and Marcel speak and, and hear perhaps our special guests. We have two nights on the 19th and 20th. And to help celebrate that, we just got in our special annual commemorative coin. We, we made Ape Canyon coins. And I'll tell you, Bobes, they are cool. 
They're uh, gold and silver, not real gold and silver. They sure look like it, though. Gold and silver, and then we have the Murphy on one side, on the back side. Uh, we change the design every year. And this year it says Ape Canyon Centennial across the top. It has um, a, a 2024 in the very bottom, but also has 1924 right above it because this is the 100-year anniversary of the Ape Canyon events. If you want one, there's only a limited number of them. You can get them at the NABC store. But, man, um, I'm, I'm, of course, going to give you, and maybe even Matt Pruitt, one. That'll make mine less special if you give him one, too. Uh, you're right. You're right. So uh, Matt will get one and you won't, is what you're saying? Oh. <laughs> the other thing I need to mention, of course, is for our new listeners, um, you may want to know that if you are tired of hearing advertising that doesn't seem like it, uh, it applies to you, you can now listen to Bigfoot and Beyond with no ads whatsoever. All you have to do is become a member. And if you want to be a member, there's a link in the show notes and there's also a website um, Bigfoot be on podcast.com. Go there, hit the membership keys, and we'll set you up there. So, well, enough talking from us. I mean, the reason everybody's here to listen today is because we have we have Heather Mosier on. Is it Mosier, by the way, or is it it's not Mosser? No, it's Mosier. You got it. Yeah, we have Heather Mosier on today. Um, she is the host of the Small Town Monsters podcast called The Lore You Know. Um, and she, it's really, she she has her her fingerprints all over. I think most, if not all of the small town monster stuff. I know Heather on a personal level because we've been to the woods. I, I've, I've done some filming for small town monsters. She's always been lurking around behind and I don't even know what else she's into. I know she's cool as all get out. I know that she has a lot of weird experiences and that's why we invited her on the podcast today. So Heather, thanks for coming on. Hey Heather. I'm so excited to be here. Really? Why? <laughs> Because I love talking with you. It's always a good time. <laughs> yeah. Last time I saw you is when we were filming the Momo movie. Yeah, I've got a, it's, it's amazing the, the, as much as my daughter has grown, I have an awesome picture of you two with my daughter and she's about to be 13 next week. Wow. It's been a few years. Yeah. So I think it's fair to say that we've, we've played a pretty important role in her life, I guess. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So, so Heather, uh, be, uh we're going to get to your podcast eventually, of course, but, um, how long have you been in this, like the weird critter monster game for lack of a better term? Well, for small town monsters, um, specifically I've been involved since Momo. That was the first movie that I got to work on, but I've always been interested in, I mean, it's like a lifelong, uh, love of the strange and unusual going back to <clears throat> whenever I was younger and watching like unsolved mysteries on TV. Huge fan of that. Um, grew up with some weird stories that my parents would tell me. And it was just always, always something that caught my attention. But then as I got older and got into college, I would find ways to try to integrate some of the weird and unusual into my studies because I was a, a classics major. So Latin literature, things like that. It's always been there, and I started to look into cursed objects, and that led me to the Bell Witch, which then eventually led me to getting involved with Small Town Monsters, because Seth had announced that they were going to be doing something on the Bell Witch, and I said, hey, <laughs> I've been looking into this. I don't know if you need a researcher, but I'm pretty well versed on that legend, so if you need any help, let me know. And he said, yeah, actually, I do. Let's start you with Momo first, though, and see how it goes. So we started with Momo, and then... Mothman Legacy was after that, and then the Bell Witch. So, so uh, you said that your parents would tell you weird story. Was it uh, weird stories about things that happened to them? Well, so <clears throat> I mean, I grew up not far from in, where I live now is Minerva, Ohio. So, um, with the story of the Minerva monster, growing up hearing about Bigfoot in the area, it kind of was just a a thing, you know, like nobody questioned whether Bigfoot existed or not. It's just Bigfoot's out there in the woods type situation. So I grew up with that, but. The stories that I grew up with were from mostly from my mother talking about the farmhouse that she grew up in as a young girl and how it was supposedly haunted. And she found that out because one Christmas, my grandmother had bought the bought her kids a Ouija board. Did she not like you? Like, why would she do that? <laughs> she bought them all uh, a Ouija board. And, um, my mom loved it. My aunt on the other hand was terrified of it and demanded that it be burned. And eventually my grandmother did burn the board. But, um, anyway, before it was burned, they were on it for a little bit. And it said that there was a spirit in the house and the spirit's name was Elizabeth and that she lived in my mother's room, which mom thought was pretty cool. And they didn't really have any activity that happened necessarily while they lived there. But when they went to move out a few years later, 
and they were going through the old deeds to the house, they actually found Elizabeth's name on one of the deeds, which was odd because of how old the house was to even have a female's name on the deed to begin with. But um, anyway, once they sold the house, it went through a series of owners. It would change hands pretty often. And the people that would sell it after that would cite things that were happening in the house. Like they couldn't keep light bulbs on, light bulbs would just burst or they'd turn off or they'd see things on the stairs and they just had an uneasy presence. And that continued for I believe because I went back through some of the records at the local courthouse. So that went on for probably 10 to 15 years before it got in the hands of a family who owns it now currently. Um, And they haven't had any, well, they've had things happen, but not enough to move out by any means. So I just grew up with that story of Elizabeth and (laughs) the Ouija board and uh, yeah, all the haunted stuff happening there and always thought that was interesting. Along with the Bigfoot stuff. Yes, along with the Bigfoot stuff. Yeah, now, of course, we'll get to that in a little while because I know a little bit about the background of where you live and things like that. But uh, before we move on to any future things here, so you studied Latin. Yes. Now, now, uh, first of all, say something cool in Latin for us. Uh, we didn't learn to speak Latin. We learned to translate it. No, but you must know like a cool <laughs> phrase or two. I mean, I mean, I can say just salve is hello. But other than that, I don't really know any phrases now. Vidi vidi vici. You know, well, that, that's what I'm looking for. Like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not asking for conversational Latin because, you know, that, that doesn't exist really. I was looking for something cool, like, you know, you don't get what you don't poop for or something, or something like that, you know, like some sort of snazzy saying. Yeah. So the Vidi Vidi Vici would work. I came, I saw, I conquered. That's Caesar's quote, Julius Caesar's quote. That's the first one off the top of my head. Um, it's been a while because that was something that I haven't gotten into in, in a few years now since I graduated. Once I started in the STM stuff, I haven't really looked at Latin much. Well, you know, um, I'd like to I'd like to think that uh, Bigfoot and Beyond is a podcast that the guests kind of walk away thinking, well, that was challenging to be on. <laughs> uh, we'll see. I'll let you know. <laughs> well, you said Vidi Vidi Vice. It reminds me of that. What was that robot's name on that Buck Rogers um, that, uh TV series in the seventies, Beatty. I think it was Beatty. He spoke like that. Beatty, Beatty, Beatty. That's real. Uh, so am I, Bobo. So am I. So ghost stuff in your past, Bigfoot stuff in your past, and then somehow or another, you 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 stumbled upon the small town monsters, um, gang of misfits, and you've been kind of dragged along on their adventures ever since. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, it seems like my role keeps expanding. I mean, it goes from like with Momo when Seth asked me to start helping. It was literally just find me a, give me a list of names of people that I could potentially interview. And so just handing a list over to Seth to now I'm the one contacting people and setting stuff up. I've now the role of producer um, and then have the podcast, of course. And now we've launched a publishing company and I'm the editor for the books and it's just more stuff all the time. And it's been pretty awesome. It does seem that small town monsters is blossoming into much more than a small production house. So I know you guys have a podcast now. You say you have a publishing house as well? Yeah, we've got Small Town Monsters Publishing, and we're actually getting ready to release our fourth book, um, which is Hunting Grounds by Aaron Deese. It's about uh, dogman encounters in the land between the lakes of Kentucky. Do you do any nonfiction, though? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Uh Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, we had the Kinderhook Creature and Beyond. If you want to stick with Bigfoot type stuff, Kinderhook Creature, we did that. That was one of our first books. Did you did you find good witnesses for the LVL? Uh, yeah, uh, one of the best witnesses that we've spoken to for LVL was Martin Groves. He had an encounter and uh, pretty. It's always it's always interesting to listen to his encounter. You can tell that there's still a lot of emotion there. Um, that it has shaken him from whatever he did experience. Um, it still bothers him to this day, and that becomes pretty obvious whenever he starts to recount his story. So I'd say Martin Groves is one of the best interviews that we've had from that area. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. Podcast, publishing house, uh, movie production thing. You're doing live events. Monster Fest is coming up again, I see. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And um, we are very excited about it. We're very 
excited and anxious just because uh, there's always anxiety levels uh, mixed with something like a, an event like that. But we're pretty thrilled to have it come back to Canton, you know, have something near home because that was something that was lacking. So nice to have something at home. Ohio has more than its fair share of conferences and festivals and all that other stuff, but there's really nothing up in that neck of Ohio. Um, so uh, I got to I got to appear at it last year, and it was a lot of fun, especially God for a first year conference. I'd say you guys killed it. You just absolutely killed it. Um, but I cannot I cannot imagine the level of stress that must go on behind the scenes with all those uh, moving parts and different people and times and events and speakers and egos and tables and money changing hands and all that stuff must be absolutely ridiculous. How do, how do you manage it all? I mean, you have kids too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've got three little ones. Um, well, they're not little anymore, I guess, but three kids and um I don't know. Uh, when it's all said and done, we sleep for like a week, you know, just go into hibernation for a while, <laughs> but it's just a, a lot of, a lot of projects going at once and having to really section off your time, you know, time management is important. Okay. Enough of time management. Let's get back to dog, man. When was the first person you heard about that? Uh, you, you like, were like, this could be like really something. Well, uh, that has to go back to when we filmed Skinwalker Howl of the Rougarou. Oh, so it was recent. Yeah. Talking with, uh, people that had experiences down there and the ones that really stick out to me are the ones that say that, that when they had their encounter, the best thing that they can equate it to is Anubis. I always find that intriguing, but the one that down in Louisiana that sounded or that had the encounter that looked like Anubis, what she had done was. Um, her grandfather had been tilling a garden and as he was tilling, he pushed up some native American artifacts. And as a young girl, she was curious about it. So she grabbed some and took them back into her room. And, uh, even though her grandfather said, don't disturb anything, I'm going to put it all back and we'll just make the garden somewhere else. Um, she took some pieces, went back to her room and over the next five nights, every night that she would go to sleep or attempt to go to sleep this thing would show up in her door that she said looked like Anubis um, or what later she was able to equate to Anubis because at the time she didn't really have an equivalent for it. Um, but it would show up in the door and, and kind of speak to her and tell her, you need to put this back. You're kind of disrespecting your ancestors here. And she ignored it for a few days. And then on night four or five, it actually got up next to her bed. And she said that that's when she finally took it seriously <laughs> because that was a little too close for comfort. And, um, she ended up putting it back and then she never had an experience again, which is different. I mean, that's still different than the typical dog man encounters where people are out in the woods and, and see a creature and they're absolutely terrified, but that's still one that, that stuck with me. So what's your personal opinion on that? Like after having researched it and talked to these people with dog man, that is with really any of these witnesses, it's difficult for me to say that they didn't have an experience, right? Um, especially whenever they're recounting their their experience and they're very emotional. I am not one to tell them that they didn't experience what they think that they experienced. Um, but when it comes to Dogman, it just seems like it's got to have some sort of supernatural aspect to it, I think, because of this idea that people get, this feeling they get of absolute evil. It's one of the only cryptids when we're talking about the world of cryptids that I can think of where people unanimously hate it, <laughs> like are just terrified of this thing. Um, you, you don't hear that necessarily with some of the other cryptids. I mean, there can be terrifying encounters, of course, but nothing that's almost universally terrifying as it is with Dogman. But some of the other things that people talk about, they've encountered with it, like there's odd... Um, sounds that they hear right before seeing one of course the impending sense of dread and doom um just the creature itself physically how it could exist um to me lends it more to a paranormal type realm for a dog man and you're digging around about dog man you know your research behind the scenes stuff what's the oldest account that you've ever run across that you deem to be credible ah uh, wow well, that's tough to say because when you start to go back, you end up in like werewolf lore, which can go back even as far as the ancient Greeks, as far as that goes. But then what is credible, right? As far as what stories are true. Well, here in North America, how about that? I'm not sure what the oldest one, I mean, 
recently my mind is still stuck on some of the books that Aaron has written, like Dogman Territory and um, or the Texas Dogman Triangle. And there was some from the 1800s in there where, but those, those are also not necessarily the quintessential dogman of something walking up on two legs. Those are more like hyena like, um, which I would think aren't beyond the realm of possibility either um, for seeing something that might be like a hyena that got loose. So I don't know the 1800s probably. Yeah. Cause I think Lauren, Lauren Coleman wasn't, I, I could be wrong. I thought I saw, and maybe I am, I don't know. Um, I thought Lauren wrote somewhere that the, the dog man thing wasn't really prevalent until uh, Linda Godfrey started writing her books. Well, the term wasn't for sure. The term dog man wasn't, wasn't relevant until Linda Godfrey and that she kind of put that on the map with the beast of Bray road, as far as that goes. But before that, I mean, if you start looking at what Dogman looks like and, and the way that people explain their encounters, it still, it, it overlaps with what would people would consider a werewolf. And so you got to think of like the lexicon at the time, <clears throat> if people are having experiences, if Dogman wasn't really a term that was out there, they're using the next closest thing that they can think of, which would be a werewolf. So with, um, what other sort of strange critters besides Dogmen or Sasquatches? or even ghosts, I guess, since you've had some tangential experiences with those, or maybe even personal experiences with those. Um, what's, what, what's, what are some of the odder, the stranger um, cryptids that you've had the pleasure of doing research on? Well, we had the Jersey Devil, which is quite an amalgamation of things, even though um, when we did that, <clears throat> we didn't do that typical aspect of our documentaries like we normally do. Like We didn't go out and find witnesses to the Jersey Devil. We went into a more historical aspect of things, but the Jersey devil in itself is pretty weird, uh, pretty weird creature. <laughs> um, I don't know. We go into UFOs and those can get really weird as far as the contact with aliens go on personal things, not just small town monsters, but in other things that I've researched, there's a story not too far from here about a pig lady. They can, they call her the pig lady. And uh, the idea is that she's a spirit that has a pig head and she manifests um, every once in a while over near, uh, not far from Columbiana County, Ohio, which isn't far from here, um, on the no, close to Pennsylvania. But these creatures that are the mix of things, like right now I'm looking into goat man sightings. So the ones that are anthropomorphized a little bit those are ones that I find really interesting. Well, all this research you've done, like, you know, you guys are looking at like, you know, like obviously monsters, you like look at the scary aspects of a lot of things. Have you personally done any research where you, like you think that this missing person case is attributable to a cryptid? No, I haven't done any research that, that I thought this has got to be a cryptid related situation. Um, not saying that it's not possible with certain things, but I haven't come across anything that's been like that. Not yet. Anyway, we haven't really gone down. I mean, we did land of the missing, but I mean, a lot of people go missing in Alaska as far as that goes. Um, so it's hard for me to say that that's necessarily attributed to a cryptid. What do you think? Well, I think, I think that Sasquatches are definitely responsible for some missing people, not, not a huge percentage, but yeah, like Alaska and Northern Canada, I think it's the percentage of them that are dangerous goes up considerably just because of the, the, how raw it is up there and how, I mean, just bleak it is and dead of winter, late winter. I mean, those things are, they got to eat and they were walking around out there. So we'd probably be a pretty easy meal to grab, but times are tough. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, speaking of Sasquatches, you also have the pleasure of living on or near, at least at one point in your life, um, a property where Sasquatches were frequent visitors. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the things have kind of quieted down on the farm specifically because we had uh, oil and gas pipelines come in and cut down. Uh, I mean, I'm guessing that this is part of the reason that it's died down, um, cut down a large portion of the woods and then dig up the ground. And um, things have quieted down over the last year or so since they left. So I'm hoping that we get, um, get some, activity again, but I don't know if we were just lucky in that things happened to be traveling through during the few months that we were filming uh, the Bigfoot project or what, but um, 
that was specifically on the farm. But recently there was a sighting actually um, in Carroll County on a road that if you remember when I took you out to where my parents live um, and we went out in the woods there and we heard this howl um, or what sounded like a howl, there was a sighting there recently within the last couple weeks, actually, on um, just over the hill from there. It was on one of the roads that I took you guys on um, when you were here. So stuff is still happening in the area. No, I, I think that was I think that was a howl. I think that was one of them. It's like one of these rare, not unheard of, but rare daytime vocalizations. And we just happened to have had the cameras running at the time. I think that was a solid hit. Yeah, that was it was pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, stuff's still happening there in that area for sure. Um, cause the sighting was a road crossing sighting. Oh yeah. You know, I, th- I think that they're probably residents there, you know, they're just the, the locals, you know, so to speak. <laughs> um, but what about that, uh, that other, uh, um, property where, where like Seth saw one and all that other stuff. How did that come on your rate? I mean, I know you, you lived there for a while. I don't know if you still do or not. How did that start? Um, so that was family property. Um, and, uh, we had just moved there in August, I believe. And, um, it was, I don't remember what year it was at this point, but a couple years ago, but it was August when we moved in. And, uh, I had a friend fly in from, she was in Oregon at the time, fly in from Oregon to visit. And we had gone out into the woods and, uh, <clears throat> she wanted to do like a paranormal investigation. Uh, and she was getting uneasy in the woods. So she made us go out into the field. So when we were out in the field, I just, I was getting kind of bored. <laughs> so I'm like, this doesn't seem like a, an investigation of any sort right now. I'm like, let's just, let me play this Ohio howl that I've, that I've heard before on my phone, um, which was recorded in Columbiana County, just the next county over. Um, so I played the howl and we got a return howl back. Um, and that was kind of the beginning of that. And coupled with the fact that when we first moved here, this farm is on 300 acres um, and it's a mix of fields and woods. But what I would do when we first moved here was I would take different rocks and crystals and things and I hid them around the woods with the idea that when my kids got older and they were exploring that they'd find these little treasures. So after we had that experience with the howl, I went back out to one of the places where I had kept my crystals and one of the crystals was gone. And in its place was a vertebrae. Um, I'm guessing a deer vertebrae based on the size of it. And I immediately called Seth (laughs) and I'm like, you're not going to believe what's going on here. But you know, we had this howl a few nights ago and now this crystal's gone and there's a vertebrae in the plate in its place. And um, I was already picking it up and looking at it. And he of course was like, don't touch it. I'm like too late. I already, (laughs) sorry, I already picked it up. But uh, what would happen over the next few weeks then is that um, the different crystals and things, they would get moved. They wouldn't disappear like that one. The one that disappeared was actually gone for about a month. And then it was returned in the exact same place, except it was covered in mud, Um, which was really weird. But I I told Seth about this and he said, well, let me come out with a camera and see what what I can see, you know, what happens here. And, um, that's how the Bigfoot project was born. And the, especially the very first episode, you can see a lot of the activity that occurred, um, one of our first nights here. And I think that a lot of that was attributed to the fact that we had our kids at the back cabin. Um, and I think that they were kind of interested and intrigued by what was going on with the children, especially because that seemed to be one of the most activity Uh, most active nights that we would had were when the kids would be around. Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. Now, when you say the back cabin, is that the one that uh, was on the road or there's another cabin uh, pretty far out by a little pond? Yeah, that cabin. That's the back cabin. The one that I'm talking about is the back cabin. Uh, The one that's by the pond. That's where we had all of our activity. That's a pretty good distance from the main house, too, if I, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it is. I know when I, I had an opportunity to visit, I was doing um, the Ohio Bigfoot Conference a handful of years ago, and I was invited out by uh, you all to come uh, spend a few days out there and do some filming and stuff. I don't, I, I don't. Did you ever use all that? I don't even know. 
Yes, we did. It, I was very impressed with the property. I mean, it, it's it's excellent Bigfoot habitat for uh, um, that part of the country. It's very typical, you know, just a mixture of huge wide open fields with pockets of woods that are all kind of um, intertangled together with various, you know, green belts connecting this area to that area and deep ravines and, and, and just rolling hills. It's pretty amazing stuff. It was a really neat place to visit. It's uh, pretty nice out here. I, I, I like the variation in the topography and yeah, I liked when I, when I took you out to where I grew up um, and you had mentioned that it was like a box Canyon type situation, I believe is the terminology you used. Yeah. That place is squatchy as I'll get out. That place is nuts. Like, like that, that's if, if, if I lived anywhere near there, that's where I would be going, you know, weekly. See, I need to get Seth on that because he hasn't gone and stayed the night out there yet, but. No, just go walk up during the day and look, you know, train yourself to track and start tuning your eyes. Um, just go out there as much as you can. I, that, that one Canyon that we walked up where we happened to get that vocalization. Um, I don't think you need to go anywhere else. I mean, they're pro- they're not there all the time, obviously, but they'd be there some of the time. So I know, um, I know Seth saw one on the property. Has anyone else observed a Sasquatch on that big farmland that you live on? No, not that I'm aware of. Um, if they did, it was before we moved here. Seth saw that one uh, while they were out filming B-roll and I was at the main house watching the kids and he came back to the house. I was just so excited about what he'd seen. And um, you could see a little bit was caught on film, but it, it was one of those situations where it was far enough away that it just looks like a little blob, you know, going across the screen. But yeah, he was, uh, he was fortunate enough. And as far as I know, the only one that's seen anything here. Right now, uh, Small Town Monsters probably has a handful of projects going. I know that there's, you know, Eli was just here at the museum a few weeks ago filming some stuff for this thing. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, all, 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 you, all the minions are out doing whatever they do. And Seth included. I think Seth himself is a, is a minion. <laughs> What's an exciting project that you're working on that you can talk about? Well, we are working, like you said, we're working on a handful right now. Um, well, we're getting ready to go to North Carolina and film the next uh, installation of On the Trail of Bigfoot. This one's going to be called The Ancients. So I can't talk about that one too much in depth, because primarily because we haven't shot it yet. But that's the one that's on my radar most heavily at the moment. But we're also simultaneously working on Cryptid Goatman. So I'm still scouring for Goatman encounters or storytellers who can tell us about Goatman in their area, because that seems to be something that is spread out through the United States. Um, everybody, every state seems to have its own little goat man legend um, somewhere. And uh, then we have the Thomas Mantell project, um, which is going to be called Lost Contact. We're filming that in bits and pieces. And that took place in Kentucky. Franklin, Kentucky is where Thomas Mantell crashed after chasing um, a UFO. He lost control of the plane and um, ended up dying as a result of it. When was that? That was in 1948. It's touted as the first, one of the first um, instances of the military going after a UFO. And then, of course, it unfortunately resulted in his death. But um, yeah, that was around Franklin, Kentucky is where he he passed away. And that was in 1948. And we just recently got back from a trip where um, we had interviewed some original witnesses, actually. Um, So they were very young at the time, but they remember the crash itself. And that was something very interesting. Is there plane wreckage still out there in the woods somewhere? So supposedly the government came in and recovered everything. But then there's also the story, like it's a, there's two different stories. One that the government came in and reclaimed everything, especially the large pieces. Like there's no doubt that the large pieces of the plane were recovered and taken somewhere, probably Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, but we're not sure. But then there's another story that large sections of it, uh, like the little pieces of debris and stuff, but still a decent amount, were just put into a pit and buried. And so we're trying to find out if that's true as well. I, li- I like the historical stuff. Those are some of my favorite things that are done out there are the researches that are tangential to, you know, in my case, Sasquatch or whatever whatever weird thing you're into. But um, when, when it touches on history like that and there's remnants kind of left behind for people. You know, I think that's probably one of the coolest things about uh, this kind of work at least. Yeah. That's, I mean, this even something like when we did the bell, Witch, it was interesting because the bell, Witch story, I mean, it's still being talked about, but you can go and see 
the remnants of the homestead where the Bell family lived, even though that story was from the early 1800s. You can still see bits and pieces of it. And I, I agree. I love when you can correspond these stories with some stuff that's left in modern day. It kind of brings history home a little bit. It kind of grounds it into our own lives and connects us. Because really, history wasn't that long ago. You know, like 1800 wasn't really that long ago when it comes down to it. Um, but, you know, for 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 at least my sake, and I'm assuming a couple of our listeners as well, can you tell us about the Bell Witch? Sure. So in 1817, in a place that's now known as Adams, Tennessee, it's in Robertson County, Tennessee, there was a family that had recently moved from North Carolina, uh, the Bell family. And they lived in a cabin on a nice, nice area of farmland. And one day the patriarch of the family, John Bell, was out checking the fields and he saw supposedly this creature that was half dog, half rabbit, as in it had a dog's body, but the head of a rabbit. Um, disturbed him. He shot at it. It disappeared. So, and I'm not, it's not clear whether it just like disappeared in a puff of smoke or if it ran away or whatnot, but either way, he didn't kill it. Um, shortly after that happened, his children started to see weird things like oversized birds, uh, odd things out in the fields as well. And pretty soon they all started hearing like scratching on the walls of the cabin, uh, gnawing on the bed post at night. And of course we're talking the early 1800s. So it's not like they had electricity at the time. They would light their candles or lanterns to see what, what was making the sounds. And whenever the lights would come on, then the sounds would stop. And this went on for quite some time until they started to invite people over like the neighbor to try to help them figure out what was going on. And they invited the one neighbor, James Johnson over and he started to hear these sounds and he out loud had demanded that whatever this thing was creating these sounds that it let itself be known. And once he kind of demanded that, then whispers started just disembodied whispering. And eventually the whispering became clear enough that it started talking in this entity starts explaining that it's there to punish John Bell and it doesn't care for John Bell. It never explains why, just says that it's there to punish him and um, subsequently does continue to torture him over the next few years and his daughter, Betsy Bell, the oldest daughter, um, tortures the family, gives them many sleepless nights. It becomes quite a story. People come from all over the country to to experience the bell witch because people would come in and they'd, they'd let neighbors and strangers come in and stay on their property. And they would actually experience the, the voices and things moving across the room and whatnot. Um, you know, typical poltergeist activity. And this went on until December 20th of 1820, John Bell had been getting ill and had gotten worse and worse. And on the 20th, he did not awaken. And next to his bed, they found a vial of dark liquid that was half empty. Um, and the witch, supposedly, her voice came out and said that she had fixed him that night. She she made sure that he was dead. That, that was her doing. And uh, sure enough, he was gone. The story goes that to figure out what the <laughs> what the what was in the vial, they took a drop of it and gave it to the cat. And the cat subsequently died as well. So they knew that it was poison. But she sang and carried on and was very joyous at his funeral as well. And the next spring made sure that Betsy knew that Betsy could not continue on with her engagement that she was in at the time with a man named Joshua Gardner. Um, she kind of threatened Betsy and said, if you continue down this path, you know, remember what I did to your dad, the same thing will happen to your fiance. So she breaks the engagement with him and then ends up marrying somebody else and eventually moves away. But in a, in a nutshell, that's the story of the Bell Witch. It's, it goes on from 1817 to 1821. And supposedly she comes back around 1826 and talks to the oldest Bell son, uh, John Bell Jr., and gives him predictions of the future, like predicts uh, World War I and World War II. And it just reminds me of Nostradamus in a way. Um, as far as her predictions go. But then she disappears. She was supposed to come back in 107 years. And as far as we know, she never really came back. But the story is that she still can be irritated um, and agitated and haunts the area today, but not in the same way that she did with the family. She's not 
killing anybody by any means, but she will get upset if disrespected. Well, I get that irritation thing. People can be pretty hard sometimes. <laughs> so the podcast, um, how did that start? Because you're doing it and I didn't even know about it. And I've just seen it every once in a while on Twitter or something like that. And I go, oh, look at that. <laughs> how many episodes in are you? Uh, we're over 40 episodes in at this point. We did have to take a break. Um, we started it a couple years ago and then we had to take a break because we lost our showrunner. Um, so until we got somebody else to come in and kind of produce the episodes, all of the podcasts on the network kind of took a break for about a year. Did the witch get them? Uh, yes. Yeah, exactly. He had, he was disrespectful. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but yeah, we're 43 episodes in at this point, I believe. Um, yeah. And the idea started with uh, Seth had said he wanted to come up with some new shows and I threw out the idea of um, the lore, you know, because based on the more, you know, I love that title. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, he said, yeah, let's make it an interview show and bring people on and, and talk to them. And so that's what it is. It's um, a story, a storytellers podcast, um, storytellers and folklorists. And I like to just talk to people about stories and ask them at the end of each episode, I say, can you tell me a story? and uh, see what they've got. So the rest of the time we talk about, well, what they what they have done, their personal experiences, any encounters that they've had, because um, it still is an STM podcast. So it is related to, you know, Bigfoot or Mothman or any of these um, cryptids that we've covered and or the paranormal um, or their researchers that maybe didn't have personal experiences, but have had plenty of stories told to them by people. And so we we dive into that for the episode. And then at the end, I ask them to tell me one of their stories. So here's a question for you. Would you rather be trapped in a house with um, Seth or Eli for one week? Oh my, for a week? Can't leave. All your groceries are there. That's against the Geneva Conventions. <laughs> well, Eli will hate that. Probably Seth, because listen, I've been trapped with Eli in places. And if I have like, you're talking about a week's worth of groceries. The groceries wouldn't last. Eli would just eat them all. Oh, he's a grown boy, man. Yeah. <laughs> Seth would at least share where would like when we were in Alaska, um, the first night that Eli joined us, I had leftovers in the fridge and the next morning they were gone because Eli had been hungry and just went in. He didn't even know whose they were. He just ate leftovers. Oh, that's an ass whooping. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd probably stay with Seth for the week over Eli, but Eli's great too. You just got to watch your food. That's all. You know, we, we featured Eli in um, the most recent um, uh, museum member video. He came out, he was filming whatever he was doing or whatever. And we went out because somebody heard vocalizations the night before at uh, this place up by Lolo Pass Road that uh, a lot of stuff happens up there. So we went up there and walked around in the snow and it was terrible and stuff. But I'll tell you what, man, the, the thing about Eli I respect, and I respect like all the small town monsters people are great. You know, don't get me wrong. There's not a one of you that I, I don't enjoy spending time with. Every one of you guys is great. I don't know how how any of you guys got so lucky to be involved in such a, um, a, a wonderful Muppet production like you do, you know? Um, but uh, the thing about Eli that I, I respect more than anything is that um, it, it's the poncho and the hat. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like, I couldn't wear that. Bubba, well, Bubba might be able to, but I, I couldn't pull that off. Yeah, me either. It's Eli's thing for sure. I've got photos back in the 80s pulling that off, no problem. Do you? <laughs> yep. Well, tell me about that. The group of guys I have, we always buy ponchos down. When we went to Baja, we'd always get ponchos because we love the, the good, the bad, the ugly. Like all those Clint Eastwood movies where he wore the poncho. Sure. So, yeah. Then Harachis, surf trunks. I speak on behalf of all of our listeners that we demand to see those pictures as soon as possible. I can find, I can find some. Oh my god, I would love that. She didn't invent Jack, Eli. <laughs> Stay tuned for more Bigfoot and Beyond with Cliff and Bobo. We'll be right back after these messages. What's next for you there, Heather? Like, what's going on? Like, what are you looking forward to next? I know you're working on a lot of things, um, is, but it has to be a lot more than work for you. I mean, you must enjoy this sort of thing. What, what, what's really got you going right now? What are you stoked about? Um, well, I'm really excited about Monster Fest coming up, uh, for one, and just to 
hopefully it, we have a turnout like we did last time. So I'm excited about that coming up, but I am really jazzed about this ancient shoot um, to get back to the area around Cherokee, North Carolina. Uh, that's a place that I got to visit a lot whenever I was younger, but I haven't been there in quite some time. So I'm excited to go back there. And that's pretty much the next big, the big thing to look forward to for me. Are you usually on the shoot? Are you usually out in the field with everybody? Uh, I'm usually on the shoot. It depends on the situation as to whether I'm out in the field or if I'm back at the Airbnb helping conduct interviews because sometimes sets out in the field. And so I'm the one running the interviews back at the, at the house. So it just depends on this particular shoot. I'm still getting the schedule together. Um, it looks like there's going to be at least a couple days where I will be running the interviews while Seth is out in the field. And how many days does it take to make a, a standard feature? And your features are about an hour, aren't they? Yeah, they're anywhere from like 80 to 90 minutes on average. Oh, so, okay. So hour and a half or so then. Okay. And how, how long does it take to shoot all that on average? I know that everyone's different, you know, and, and I, I know that. Yeah. Uh, well, for the larger project, like this one is going to be about a five day shoot. Um, where we're trying to get them shorter and shorter. So, um, just because it's harder to get away from the kids, um, for, for longer shoots, like, uh, once upon a time when we did Alaska, we were there for 17 days and that's just not realistic anymore with our little ones. Do you guys ever have uh, stuff happen at base camp when you're filming out there, like on the Bigfoot stuff, especially like if you're out in the woods and like they're out filming in the woods, like you're back at base camp, you know, like organizing stuff. Do you guys ever have something happen there, like rocks thrown or knocks or whoops or anything like that? Uh, that hasn't happened too often. I mean, Seth's been out and had some things happen when he's out in the field, but, um, as far as like with the rest of us, no, we haven't really, um, the most that's occurred back at base camp would have been more like paranormal type stuff, which everybody dismisses. It seems like, except me. <laughs> what, 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 what have you had happen paranormal at base camp? When like, what were you filming? Where? We've had things like it sounds like doors slamming or people walking upstairs or something like that when there's no one else in the house. Um, and everybody just kind of shrugs it off or, oh, it must have been whatever. And they don't want to really want to talk about it. But um, or they just look at me and kind of shake their head. <laughs> like it's your fault. Yeah. Like somehow it's my fault or, oh, you're just going to take this and run with it or whatever. But I'm like, listen, I'm not it's not like I drop everything and say, OK, guys, let's investigate. Um, I just kind of like like that something happened. and we move on, but I just, sometimes I wish that more would occur so that we wouldn't have so many naysayers on the crew <laughs> with the paranormal stuff. But doesn't that suck when you're with uh, people that don't even like you're working on a project like that and they don't even think it's real. Right. If we're doing paranormal stuff, they're totally out on that. It seems like for the most part, and uh, we don't really get to work on paranormal stuff very often, but when we do, it's a lot of the people on the crew are not too keen on that. I feel like I should apologize to you for that, Bobo. Huh. <laughs> Apology accepted. Well, Heather, we're just about out of time here. And uh, um, so if, if people want to check out what you're doing, what Small Town Monsters in general is up to, um, uh, why you, your, your podcast, of course, is a great thing So you can hear for people to listen to because they can hear it directly from your mouth, the things you think and the things you've investigated and talked to people about called The Lore You Know. Work, and people can get that probably on the same podcast platform they listen to this one, right? Mm-hmm, absolutely. And Small Town Monsters, are you guys still exclusively on YouTube? <laughs> no. We do have a lot of our stuff on YouTube, of course, but we um, you can find us on Tubi. You can find our movies on Amazon. Um, we actually are getting ready to launch um, something called Unexplained TV, which will be uh, a fast channel that certain distributors will be picking up, and then it'll just be a channel that you can turn to that's just STM all the time. 24 hours a day. Um, so if you, people keep a watch on small town monsters or our newsletter, um, whenever that comes out to different platforms, we'll put that out there and people can watch small town monsters 24 hours a day. Holy crap. <laughs> Congratulations on all the progress forward. You know, clearly I'm way out of touch. Um, um, you guys are just everywhere. So congratulations to you and the entire team. That's fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Thanks Heather. Appreciate you showing up. Let's get a little more spooky and creepy in the member section coming up now. We'll, we'll do a bonus episode here for our Patreon members. All right, folks. Well, thanks to Heather Moser for joining us. And we're going to get a little creepy with her in the Beyond Bigfoot and Beyond for our members. So until next week, y'all keep it Beyond Squatchy. Thanks for 
Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Bigfoot and Beyond. If you liked what you heard, please rate and review us on iTunes. Subscribe to Bigfoot and Beyond wherever you get your podcasts and follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bigfoot and Beyond Podcast. You can find us on Twitter at Bigfoot and Beyond, that's an N in the middle, and tweet us your thoughts and questions with the hashtag Bigfoot and Beyond. 